So last week we talked about calorimetry, right? We talked about the heat change associated with changing phases, right? So if you go from um, solid to liquid to gas, <clears throat> or if you went from gas to liquid to solid, right? Or also we talked about um, increasing the temperature, how much heat is associated with doing all those things, right? That was all calorimetry. But what we're doing today also involves heat as well. We technically call it thermochemistry, but it's the same principle. We're going to be calculating heat change associated with chemical reactions. And there are two methods that we're going to use. We're going to use Hess's law. Oops, there's an S there. Hess's law. And we're going to use standard heats of formation. Okay, so two methods we're going to use, standard heats of formation and Hess's law. Let's talk about the differences between these. Both of them are going to tell you how much heat is associated with a given chemical reaction. All right, so with Hess's law, how does that work? You'll be given your given overall reaction and sub steps. And then you manipulate and add as needed. I know that sounds really difficult, but it's not. Manipulate as needed and add. Okay, that's with Hess's law. And so, how does that compare to standard heats of formation? With standard heats of formation, you look up values in table and add. Okay, so both of these methods are not difficult. You just have to do the one based on the information that you're given. Okay, so I gave you a handout today for the reactions we're going to be studying so that you don't have to spend time writing them over and over and over and over. I'll save you some writing. So we're going to do two methods, Hess's Law and Standard Heats of Formation. So I'm going to turn on the projector so I don't have to write those reactions a hundred times too. While the projector warms up, is everyone okay if I erase? So, when you are doing standard heats of formation versus Hess's law, again, you just look at the information you're given and then pick the one that's appropriate to the information available to you. So, no, a new blank one. All right. So let's do Hess's law first. There are some rules, okay? So looking at the handout that I just gave you, calculate delta H for the overall reaction. Here's the overall reaction, here's the reaction I'm interested in, and then here are the sub steps that we're gonna be working on, okay? And so there are some rules. If you multiply or divide a step, do the same to delta H. So for example, let's look at this one up here that, on the handout. Don't, I wouldn't write this on your handout just quite yet. But let's just pretend that I divided this whole sub-step by three. I would also divide delta H by three, okay? So if I went through and I divided everything, all these coefficients by three, so that this becomes one third, one third, one third, I would also do the same thing to delta H. If I multiply this reaction times four, just for fun, so make that one eight, four, and eight, what would I do to delta H? 
I would also multiply it by four, okay? The other rule that you need to know is that if you reverse a step, do the same to delta H, okay? So if I reverse this so that it becomes SO2, breaking down into S plus O2, my new delta H would be positive, right? If you reverse the reaction, what used to be the products are now the reactants. That means that the delta H sign is reversed, okay? And those are really the only rules. And so I think the best thing to do is just practice this. Because once you see it worked out a few times, I think you'll get the hang of it. Hess's law is not difficult. Again, it just requires you to pay a little bit of attention to what you're given and what you want. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom this in so that it picks up better on the camera. Okay, so this is the overall reaction that I want. These are the data that I'm given and their delta H values. Now remember, delta H is just changing enthalpy for heat. Okay. So, let's look at my reactions and my products. I have coefficients 2, 3, 2. I have coefficients of 1 here, 2, 1, and 2. What should I do here? SO3, I want it to be a product. Is it already a product here? So do I need to reverse this reaction or leave it alone? Leave it alone. S is in this reaction and it's as a reactant. So do I need to reverse this one? No. What, what's the only thing I need to do? There's only one thing I need to do before I add. Has anyone seen it yet? The coefficient of sulfur is two in my desired reaction, what is it here? One. One. So if I want to make this coefficient two, what do I have to do to this entire reaction? Multiply by two. Multiply by two. All right, so if I multiply this whole thing times two, that gives me, and then I need to do the same thing over here. That makes my new coefficients two, two, and two and then 297 negative times two, 297 times two gives me 594. Am I able, now when I add these up, add these up, notice two SO2 is a reactant, two SO2 is a product, so what's gonna happen there? If they match exactly, it's just like when you're doing net ionic equations and you're crossing out spectators, right? The same thing's a reactant and a product, and the coefficient is exactly the same, you can cross them out. Now what if this one was four and this one was two? You just subtract the two from the four, okay? Is there anything else that's gonna happen? I've got two O2s on the reactant side and one O2 on this reactant side, so what's gonna happen when I combine those two? Two plus one gives me three. So now my final answer is two sulfur plus two plus one is three O2 gives me two SO3. Is that the reaction that I want? Is that the reaction I'm going for? Yes, it is. So now for delta H, I just add those two values up as well. So negative 594 plus negative 198 gives me delta H reaction, negative 792, and my units would be kilojoules. Make sense? Make sense? It's easy enough, isn't it? Does everyone see how we did this one? Anyone need me to leave this up? So here we only had to do one manipulation. Is it always going to be that easy? Of course not. Got to start with an easy one. But I think seeing an easy one should give you the hang of it. So what I'm going to do is 
I'm going to scroll up the screen. I want you to try the second one on that handout. So you try this one. You can work with a friend if you'd like. Calculate delta H for this reaction right here, given this, and see if you can come up with an answer. I'm going to pause the recording while you try that. All right, let's go over this one. I know not everybody might be fully finished, but I think you're probably on the way to being finished at least. So the way that I do these problems is I look at my given equation that I want, and I look at what I've got to work with, and then I just decide is something on the reactant side or on the product side, and then do my coefficients match. So I want N2 to be a reactant, okay? Find the reaction containing N2. Well, it's this one, all right? Also, I want NH3 to be a product. Well, it's currently listed as a reactant. So what should I do? We need to reverse it. So let's just scratch this whole thing out. So now it becomes 1 half N2 plus 3 halves H2 produces NH3. And now delta H is negative, right? Because if you reverse it, you change the sign of delta H. Is that all to get it to be the way I want it? Make your coefficients match, right? One half, three halves, and one versus two and four. So what do I need to do here? Multiply, by four. multiply the whole thing by four, right? So if I multiply this whole thing times four, four times one half gives me two. And four times three is 12 divided by two is six. And then four times one is four. But what do I have to do to my delta H as well? Multiply, Multiply it by four. So what's that come out to be? What's negative 46 times four? Someone with a calculator. Negative 184. 184 kilojoules. Okay, now let's look at the second one. We're basically gonna do the same thing. I want H2O as a reactant, it's currently a product, and I want O2 as a product, it's currently a reactant. So what do I need to do? We need to reverse it, so let's cross it out. So now I've got 2H2O becomes 2H2 plus O2, Delta H goes from being negative to being positive, right? Yes. What about my coefficients? Do they match? What do I need? Let's look at it. 3O2, 1O2, 6H2O, 2H2O. So what do I need to do? Multiply the whole thing times 3. But I need to do the same thing to delta H. So when I multiply by 3, let's go through and change that. 3 times 2 gives me 6. 3 times 2 gives me 6, and 3 times 1 gives me 3. And what's 484 times 3? 1,452. Okay. Thank you. Am I ready to add now? Yes. Yes, I can just go ahead and add. So I'm going to add these things. Okay, is there anything that's going to cancel? My 6H2s go away, right? Because I've got 6 on the reactant, 6 on the products. If I had had 1 and 5, right, I would subtract the 1 from the 5. But because they match exactly, I just cancel them out. They're just like spectator ions. Is there anything else that gets condensed? Nope, there's not. So I'm left with 2N2 plus 6H2O produces 4NH3 plus 3O2, and what's delta H for the reaction? When I add negative 184 to 1,452, what'd you come up with? What do you get? 286, okay, my units are kilojoules. Now that's positive, so does that mean that this is exothermic or endothermic? This is endothermic, right. 
remember when delta H, which is the same thing as Q, right, is positive, that means that's heat that's got to go in. When delta H, which is the same thing as Q, is negative, that's heat that's being released. How do you feel about this? It's easy, right? It's not that bad. Okay, why don't you go ahead and try the next one. I'll clean up the board here and pause the recording. Go ahead, get started working on the next one. Again, just like with the last one, you can work together if you'd like, or you can work by yourself and maybe compare with a friend when you come up with an answer. So the last one on that page, calculate delta H for this reaction, given these data. And I'll pause the recording. Okay, let's go over this one. Delta H for this reaction, given these data. Okay, so again, we want to look at our reactants and our products of the, the um, steps we're given, and then does it match what we want? Carbon monoxide and nitrogen monoxide are reactants, so let's look at carbon monoxide. It's a reactant already, and carbon dioxide is a product, it's a product already. So do I need to do anything to this one? No, I can just leave it alone for now. We might need to deal with the coefficients later. Let's look at the other one. It's N2 is a product, but it's got it as a reactant. Oh, didn't do a very good job wasting it. So let's look at our other substance, nitrogen monoxide. It's listed as a reactant. This gives it as a product. So what should I do? Reverse. We need to reverse this. So let's reverse the whole thing. That means now we've got two nitrogen monoxide becoming nitrogen gas plus oxygen gas. And that means delta H is now what? Negative, Negative 180.6. Let's look at our coefficients. We want one, 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 one half. How am I going to obtain that? Divide the whole thing by two or multiply by one half, right? Same thing. So. 2 divided by 2 is 1. 1 divided by 2 is 1 half. And 1 divided by 2 is 1 half. What do I need to do to delta H? Divide it by 2 as well. So what does that give me when we divide by 2? Negative 90.3 kilojoules. Now am I ready to add? Yeah. You are. Because what's going to happen when I add these up? I don't want O2 in my equation, but do I have to worry about it? Nope. No, because why? It goes away without me having to do anything. So carbon monoxide, nitrogen monoxide produces CO2 plus one half into and delta H of the reaction what's that you add these two together what'd you get negative 373.3 okay is that exothermic or endothermic exothermic. that would be exothermic so if you were carrying out this reaction <coughs> in a beaker would you feel the beaker getting hot or would you feel the beaker becoming cold It'd be getting warmer, right? You feel heat coming from this reaction. How do we feel about Hess's law kind of, kind of calculations? So easy. Very easy. All right. All right. Let's contrast that to standard heats of formation, which are equally easy. It's just a different kind of easy. I'm going to save my projector bulb here. Let me jot some notes down about standard heats of formation. So that was Hess's law of your standard heats of formation. So it's just a second way of doing things. So you're going to need your reference page that I gave you. Again, this is posted in the back of your textbook. There are about a gajillion of these kinds of reference pages online as well. So if you're doing your homework and you don't have your textbook handy, you don't want to dig it off of the course webpage, because this is posted on the course webpage as well, this exact file. 
Or if you don't want to try to read this size two font that this is in, you can find one of the thousands and thousands of ones that exist on the internet. Let me make sure I'm staying in the screen here while I'm writing. Okay. All right, so you're going to need your reference information. Where did my magnet go? That's a bummer. That's walked off. Let's see if we can use static. Nope, not going to work. Oh, well, so I have to hold it, I guess. It's to the top left corner. Top left. Ah, thank you. All right, so you're going to need your appendix, okay? And we are looking at the middle column, the delta H formation column. Notice, you might want to draw a line down the middle, right? Because there's the substance, and then draw another line. And then draw another line. This is a four column chart. You see, it says aluminum and then uh, barium, barium, da, 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 da. Right, so delta H, delta G, delta S. We're not interested in delta G right now. We're not interested in delta S right now. We'll get back to those next semester in Chem 2. And then you go over next substance, delta H, delta G, delta S. And then you go over next substance, delta H, delta G, delta S. All right, so this is a four column chart. I've con condensed the humongous chart onto a very tiny piece of paper. So you have to do the same thing on the other side. So we're only interested in the delta H. Now let's talk about what that means. Delta H stands for heat, right? The degree sign means it's under standard conditions. That's what that degree sign means. Okay, the little degree sign, it means it's under standard conditions. So that means that you're at 25 degrees Celsius concentration of one molar if it's a solution. And then this little F means of formation. So delta H, heat of formation is amount of energy, amount of heat required to make one mole of that substance at standard conditions. That's what that stands for. That's why it's called standard heats of formation. So we're just breaking down what that is telling you. Okay? So again, add your columns to that chart or use the one in your textbook if you don't want to try to read size tiny font. You, know, you could get out a magnifying glass, I guess. Um, but does everyone understand what this means? Again, ignore the delta G column. That's Gibbs free energy. We'll deal with that next semester. Ignore delta S. That's entropy. We'll deal with that next semester as well. Right now, we're just doing uh, enthalpy, which is the same thing as heat. Okay. So if you were going to calculate delta H, is everyone okay if I erase? The recording will be up this afternoon. So if you miss something, you can go back and check it out. If you are doing a heat of reaction by standard heat to formation, delta H reaction is the sum of the heat of formation of the reactants, oh, excuse me, of the products, minus the sum of the heats of formation of the reactants using some summation notation. Oh, and I forgot the N, coefficient. N stands for coefficients. So let's just do one together. If you've got 2A plus B forming, well, actually, let's just not do a generic one. Let's do a real one. 2H2 plus O2 for doing, producing 2H2O. That's a real reaction, right? That reaction exists. And we need to state our states. Gas, gas, gas. Because your standard heats of formation are state specific. Okay, the one for liquid versus gas versus solid is going to be different. To calculate delta H reaction here, We look up the heat of formation for water and we multiply it by two. It's always products minus reactants. So it would be two 
Now look at your handout. Water is under hydrogen, so it's in this fourth column, far right. H2O gas is negative 241.8. Okay, and now I can save you some time. Anytime you've got a pure element in its most stable form, this is a pure element, right? H2 is a pure element. O2 is a pure element, and this is the most stable form of both of these. Pure elements in their most stable form are zero. If you don't believe me, look at your handout. For hydrogen, H2 gas, zero. For oxygen, which would be on the back, no. For O2, O2 gas, zero. Okay. Pure elements in their most stable form are zero. If you don't believe me, you can look it up. So two times zero plus zero, so that reduces to zero. So delta H of this reaction would just be two times negative 241.8, and my unit would be kilojoules. It's always sum of the heats of formation times their coefficients of the products minus the sum of the heats of formation times their coefficients of the reactions, okay? Delta means change in, right? Delta is always final minus initial. That's why it's products minus reactants, because this is the final state, this is the initial state. So you, does everyone see why it's products minus reactants? Because delta is always final minus initial. Final state minus initial state. So let's calculate delta H for those three reactions using the standard heats of formation. I'll turn my projector back on so we don't have to write all that stuff again. So we'll do the first one together. All right, here's the reaction we're interested in. Right here, we'll do this one. Make it a little bit bigger so we can see. Let's see if regular old S is on here. My old is S8. Yes, it is. Okay. All right, so delta H here for this reaction. Is it products minus reactants or reactants minus products? Products minus reactants. And that degree just means under standard conditions. So two times the standard heat of formation of SO3 on my handout, SO3, and these, this is the gas phase. Negative 395.8. Minus, this is zero, right? Zero plus zero, because you can multiply this number times any time, any number you want. So, calculator range. Two times 395.8 gives me negative 791.6. That's not the same number we got when we did it the first time, is it? Just look back on your notes and see what you got. Negative 792. Negative 792. Hey, so that's within sleep phase, right? If we say well, it's within experimental error. So let's do one more practice and then I'll give you some to try. Let's confirm. Let's see if these values are correct. Let's, let's test out this one and see if that's actually the delta H. Let's see if that's correct or if it's incorrect. Let's see. So it would be 2 times SO3's value, which is negative 395.8 minus 
2 times SO2's value, negative 296. And then this one's just going to be 0. So negative 791.6. And then what's this value? 296.8. So minus a negative 593.6. So 791.6 plus 593.6 gives me negative 198, which does match what the table is. Does everyone see how to do it using standard means of formation? Make sense? All right, so what I want you to do, and I'll pause the recording, calculate delta H for this one, the second one on the handout, compare it to the number we got the first time around, and then calculate it for the other one on the handout, the third one, and compare it to the number we got the first time around. So I will pause the recording and give you a few minutes to try that. All right, let's go over these and see if we got the same values that we did when we calculated them using Hess's law. So again, remember it's always products minus reactants because delta means change in, which means final minus initial. All of these are gas phase. I didn't indicate that on the handout, but they all are gas phase. So for the 302, do we have to worry about anything? No, that's zero. And then four times the standard heat of formation for ammonia. NH3 gas is negative 45.9. Okay. And then for nitrogen gas, do we have to worry about anything? No. Two times zero or a zillion times zero is all going to be the same plus six, water as a gas, H2O gas, negative 241.8. So, four times 45.9, that's negative, so negative 183.6 minus a negative, Six times two forty one point eight. So that's one hundred and four five zero point eight. So negative one eighty three point six plus one four five zero point eight gives us positive one two six seven point two kilojoules. How does that fare compared to the first time we did it? Okay. So those values are going to vary based on the textbooks we're looking at, right, for those values. But nonetheless, it's pretty it's decently close. It's not like we got a million the first time and six the second time, right? It's still very, very exo, I mean, very, very endothermic. It's still relatively close. Because again, the accuracy of your values when you're doing it using Hess's law are going to come from the accuracies of these as well. All right, any questions on how we did this one? Feeling good about standard heat of formation method? All right, let's do the last one. Again, these are all gases. I didn't indicate it on the handout, but they are all gases. So CO2, that's a gas, and it is coefficient is 1. So CO2, CO2 gas, negative 393.5 plus, what's the nitrogen gas? Is it going to matter? No. Products minus carbon monoxide. Not something you want to be breathing. Negative 110.5 plus nitrogen monoxide. Nitrogen monoxide. 
90.29. Okay, so this is negative 393.5 minus 10.5. Minus negative 20.21. So this is negative 393.5 plus 20.21. So I got 393.5 plus 20.21. I got negative 373.29. We're not worrying about sig figs here, really, because these are not calculated values. I mean, these are all values that are coming from a reference table, right? So as long as you don't have like 87 decimal places, I'm not going to worry about it. How does that compare to when we did it with Hess's law? Really close. Really close? Good. Oh, that is really close. Awesome. Okay, so how do we feel about Hess's law? How do we feel about standard heat formation? They both tell us the same information. How do you know which one to use? The information that I give you, right? So if I give you um, a reaction mechanism, which would be that list of steps, oops, then you would obviously do Hess's law. And if I don't give you anything, I just say what's delta H, then you would look it up in your reference table and do standard heat of formation. You feeling good? Any questions? Okay. Well, then that is where we are going to stop for today.